I'm Dominic Penning and I will narrate this lecture on ultrasonography of the pancreas in small animals. The main objectives of this lecture is to know the normal appearance of the pancreas in dogs and cats, as well as to be familiar with the scanning procedure to evaluate entirely the pancreas. These two first objectives can actually be found by looking at the video clips available on the Tufts iTunes U library. At the end of the lecture, you will know the common features for acute and chronic pancreatitis, the pancreatic complication of pancreatitis, as well as common pancreatic tumors such as insulinoma and carcinoma. And finally, you will be familiar with the basic interventional procedures performed on the pancreas. The pancreas is located along the greater curvature of the stomach, the descending duodenum, and the cecum and part of the colon. And this explains the challenge to identify the small organ surrounded by gas-filled GI segments. Small anatomical variations exist between dogs and cats. In dogs, the stomach usually is perpendicular to the spine, while in cats, it is lying obliquely. In addition, pancreatic lobes in cats tend to be longer and the tips are usually hooked shaped. As changes in size is one of the features evaluated to assess pancreatic disorders, here are some guidelines you can refer to. This table was made using reported mean measurements. In dogs, the reported values include a wide range of dog sizes, but as an easy number to remember for a medium-sized dog, pancreatic thickness of one centimeter is considered normal. In cats, the population size is more uniform and a pancreatic thickness of about five to six millimeter is a normal value. The pancreatic duct can be seen in both dogs and cats, but is often more obvious in cats, especially as they get older. See the thin, anechoic tubular structure that represents the duct in the left pancreatic lobe of this normal cat. Dogs has several distinct useful features that assist in diagnosing this disease. The pancreas is usually thickened. In this dog, is up to 2.4 millimeter, and is hypoechoic in the affected region. The fat saponification result in an increase in echogenicity of the fat, contributing even to outline better the inflamed pancreas. In some instances, anechoic abdominal effusion can be seen and this results from regional peritonitis and vasculitis. Functional ileus of the stomach and duodenum may be seen as static fluid or gas accumulation. And in this old English sheep dog, the duodenum seen here in longitudinal section contains a moderate amount of fluid. And in real time, there was no evidence of peristaltic activity. The inflamed pancreas is enlarged and poorly echogenic and also surrounded by hyperechoic fat. Adjacent visceral organs such as the descending duodenum in these two dogs can also appear thickened. We see the thickening of this longital segment of the descending duodenum highlighted by hyperechoic fat near the inflamed pancreas. And in this other dog, the descending duodenum showed marked thickening reaching up to 7 millimeter, 
the wall is actually measuring between the calipers and we also see that the layering is somewhat affected. The thickened inflamed pancreas is well seen and is also surrounded by hyperechoic fat. I'm going to review a video clip of a dog with pancreatitis. In the insert, you can see the probe motion. This pancreatitis affects most of the pancreas, left limb body, and right limb regions. And also notice the position of the marker on the probe. In this case, it's towards the head of the dog. On this still image, we see part of the liver, a small amount of anechoic fluid, thickened GI wall near the enlarged and hypoechoic pancreas surrounded by hyperechoic fat. On real time, here is the gallbladder containing a moderate amount of echogenic sludge, and here is the duodenum. We see at times an echoic effusion, and as we go towards the left side, we see a moderate amount of gas and fluid in the, in the stomach. The stomach appears flaccid. There is no active peristaltic activity. And as we go caudal between stomach and colon, we see hyperechoic fat and a thickened hypoechoic pancreas. Now we are reaching the region of the body of the pancreas that we see here. The pancreas is moderately thickened. And again, we are on the left side. Along the left limb of the pancreas, when we can see it, we actually notice that it has this polyechogenic lines crossing part of the pancreas and they may represent edematous changes of the pancreas. Moving back now to the region of the body of the pancreas that we see here, we see again the same feature of abdominal effusion, hyperechoic fat, alter layering of the duodenum, the mucosa is really hyperechoic to normal and we see along the right limb an enlargement of the pancreas surrounded by hyperechoic fat. Here's the colon and the duodenum. Be more challenging to diagnose as the clinical presentation can be more subtle and confusing than in dogs. As much as pancreatitis seems to affect preferentially the right lobe of the pancreas in dogs, it commonly affects the left lobe in cats. In dogs, we had described a series of features supportive of acute pancreatitis. In cats, most commonly, we'll see only one or a few of these features to support the diagnosis. And therefore, the changes may not appear as obvious as in dogs. Let's look at a few cats with pancreatitis. On the top left, we see a thicken hypoechoic pancreas surrounded by bry fat, just like what we see in dogs. Similarly, on the top right, we see in an enlarged hypoechoic pancreas surrounded by hyperechoic fat. We also have the presence of a small amount of anechoic effusion, and power angio was performed to recognize the difference between flow within the vessel and the lack of flow within this prominent pancreatic duct. A prominent pancreatic duct can be seen in pancreatitis, but as we mentioned before, it also can be seen in normal cats, especially if they are old. On the bottom left image, the body and the left lobe of the pancreas are within the upper limits of normal for size, but that portion of the pancreas appears hypoechoic. 
the body is wrapping over the portal vein and in the near field we can see the stomach. On the bottom right image we see a pancreas that is actually within normal limits for size but has irregular contour outlined by hyperechoic fat. Ultrasound is a useful monitoring tool that can be recommended especially if the clinical response to treatment is not as anticipated. In this cat, we see an enlargement of the body over the portal vein and the left lobe of the pancreas. The pancreas is hypoechoic and surrounded by hyperechoic fat on this initial examination. Eight days later, we recheck this animal and now the pancreas is nearly returned to normal size and echogenicity. Changes in cats are not uncommon. Compared to a normal appearance of pancreatic duct on this left lobe of a normal cat, we will see a few pancreatic duct changes. They vary from being dilated, like in this 12 years old cat. The oral diameter is about 2.5 mm. In this 16 years old cat, we do have a 3 mm wide pancreatic duct with thickened wall. And as we may see in these two cases, the overall diameter of the pancreatic lobe will be affected by this dilation of the pancreatic duct. In these cases, it may be difficult to use measurements as a useful feature to assess pancreatitis. We need to look also at the contents of the pancreatic duct. And in this case, we see the pancreatic tissue of this left lobe and the pancreatic duct has a prominent wall and in addition we see the presence of intraluminal sediment and small calculi that are partially mineralized and associated with shadowing. At times we may encounter hugely dilated pancreatic duct like in this 15 years old cat presented for progressive inhabitants. The markedly dilated pancreatic duct contains also partially settled cellular fluid. No calculi were seen and the etiology of such changes is often unknown. In some instances, pancreatitis in dogs or in cats can be associated with complications. Let's see a few of these complications. They will vary from necrotizing pancreatitis, which is an auto-digestion of the pancreas by itself due to severe inflammation. Pseudocyst is a collection of sterile pancreatic juice enclosed by a wall of fibrous or granulation tissue. Retention cyst can be congenital or acquired and result in the focal dilation of the pancreatic duct. Or finally, pancreatic abscess, which is a pus collection with no or very little pancreatic necrosis. We see here an image of a pseudocyst, which is the most common a complication encounter in acute pancreatitis. And in that case, we usually recognize part of the enlarged and poorly echogenic pancreas. And we see a collection of echogenic fluid in this location representing part of the necrotic pancreas. Necrotizing pancreatitis will appear as pancreatitis for part of the pancreas. The pancreas would be thickened, but we will still recognize a necotexture similar to the tissue encountered in a normal pancreas, but decrease in echogenicity and outlined by hyperechoic fat. However, as we try to follow the pancreatic parenchyma, we reach some areas where there is such a poor penetration due to the surrounding hyperattenuating fat that it may be difficult 
to decide if this is part of necrotic tissue or very inflamed pancreas. In that case, using color Doppler or power angio mode may be useful as in the near field we see vessels in the vascularized portion of the pancreas but complete absence of vascular signal in the region of the necrosis. Pancreatic abscess may appear as poorly echogenic fluid collection without or with variable thickness of a wall often surrounded by hyperechoic fat. This collection of fluid may be adjacent to the pancreas or within the pancreas as we see in this cat. Fine needle aspiration to drain part of this fluid is necessary to make the difference between a pseudocyst and an abscess. This distinction is important as the pancreatic abscess will require surgical intervention. The pancreas may be associated with extrahepatic biliary obstruction as any enlargement or mass of the pancreas in the region of the common bile duct will result in an obstruction and will lead to a gallbladder distension and a common bile duct dilation. Of course, any other process affecting the common bile duct itself, such as the presence of calculi or enlargement of lymph node or presence of gastrointestinal neoplasia or hepatic mass near the common bile duct can also lead to extrahepatic biliary obstruction. Let's see one example of extrahepatic biliary obstruction, the gallbladder contains a moderate amount of echogenic sludge and we see a significant dilation of the common bile duct in a cat. This common bile duct was over 6 mm where normal should be about 4 mm and as we follow it we could see it reaching this large cavity made of echogenic pus. This was confirmed by fine little aspiration of this cavity. Diagnosis of chronic or chronic active pancreatitis cannot be obtained only based on ultrasonographic features. However, several ultrasonographic features may be useful to lead to this diagnosis. Uh, we'll be looking for areas of fibrosis, mineralization, the pancreas tends often to have more irregular contour and we may have patchy or oral diffuse increase in echogenicity of the pancreatic tissue. Then on the first case of this 8 years old Australian shepherd, we see a longitudinal and a transverse sonograms of the right pancreatic lobe. The descending duodenum in cross-section indicate that we are on the right side of the pancreas. And the pancreas is actually within normal limits for size, reaching about 7.7 mm. However, we see changes in echogenicity. There is patchy increase echogenicity within the pancreas, as well as the presence of focally hyperechoic fat in some region near the pancreas. On the top right, this cat had actually chronic diffuse lymphoplasmocytic pancreatitis and we can see that the pancreas is slightly irregular in contour and had several hyperechoic foci bordering the pancreas itself. In this 14 years old Shih Tzu, the diagnosis was diffuse chronic active necrotizing pancreatitis with fibrosis and regeneration. And we see that the pancreas is unevenly thickened and hypoechoic. However, there are also areas of increased echogenicity. The thicker part of the pancreas reaches 1.5 centimeter and we see part of the stomach in the near field. 
And finally, in this 11 years old mixed breed dog, the pancreas, which is primarily hypoechoic, has numerous hyperechoic foci, and some of them were associated with shadowing, suggesting mineralization. That was supportive of a chronic pancreatitis, considering the known history of bouts of pancreatitis in the history of this dog. The last segment of this lecture will be on pancreatic tumors. The endocrine tumors that we are going to describe are primarily going to be the insulinoma, which are the most common pancreatic tumor in dogs. And for the exocrine tumors, we will speak about adenomas and carcinomas. There is, of course, other tumors that can infiltrate the pancreas, including ron cell neoplasia, such as lymphoma, but we won't describe them in the scope of this lecture. Insulinoma vary greatly in size. Most of them tend to be very small tumors from microscopic, but they can reach up to 5 cm in diameter. Then the likelihood to detect them is highly depending on their size. The numbers can vary from single to several nodules, as we see on these top images we see several hypoechoic nodules within the pan pancreatic parenchyma. The echogenicity is most commonly hypoechoic to the surrounding parenchyma. However, heterogeneous nodule like the one we see in this pancreas has been also reported. Very important to evaluate the regional lymph nodes and also the liver, as they are the preferred sites for metastasis. It can be challenging to detect on ultrasound. In this dog, the lesion was not identified on ultrasound and a contrast CT was performed. On the contrast study, we can outline a small hypoattenuating nodule within the pancreas representing the insulinoma that was confirmed at surgery. Nearby we see a splenic artery, the spleen, the stomach, the right kidney, the adenum, and the colon. This technique should be kept in mind as it is far more sensitive to detect a small lesions within the pancreas. Pancreatic nodule can be difficult to distinguish from enlarged lymph nodes, and we can see why. Duodenal lymph node, hepatic lymph nodes, splenic lymph nodes, as well as the chain of jejunal lymph nodes, all are in the neighborhood of the pancreas, and they all contribute to the lymphatic drainage of the pancreas. Therefore, a small pancreatic nodule may be difficult to distinguish from an adjacent, closely positioned in large lymph node. Going to evaluate now exocrine tumors, starting with pancreatic adenomas, we see in this first example on the left an incidental 1.3 cm nearly isoechoic nodule deforming the contour of the right limb of the pancreas. An ultrasound guided fine needle aspirate was used to diagnose the lesion and was confirmed as an adenoma. The nodule was thereafter regularly monitored to assess any change, any change in size or echogenicity. And on the right, in this other cat, a 12 years old cat presented for inappetence and vomiting, a smooth hyperechoic nodule was present near the pancreas. And we can see that the adjacent fat appears also hyperechoic. An exploratory surgery was performed and the histopathology of this lesion reveal a pancreatic adenoma associated with pancreatitis. 
Unfortunately, pancreatic carcinoma are more common than pancreatic adenoma. We'll see a few examples of them. Here we have actually the appearance of pancreatic carcinoma deforming the left lobe of the pancreas in this cat. The nodule is hypoechoic, similarly to this other cat where we see well the lesion being near the portal vein. The lesion is about 2 cm in overall diameter and can be actually seen in close association with the pancreas. At the bottom left, we see a large, irregular, and very inhomogeneous mass associated with foci of mineralization in this cat. During the real-time evaluation, we could identify that the lesion was closely opposed to the pancreas and most likely was originating from it. The mass was biopsy using ultrasound and was confirmed to be a carcinoma. And finally, we have a transverse sonographic view of a pancreatic mass that is affecting the right limb of the pancreas of this dog. And we also see that the mass invade the duodenal wall. A poorly differentiated carcinoma was diagnosed using a fine needle aspirate. Pancreatic carcinoma have the tendency of metastasizing to the regional lymph node or liver. And here is an example of a large mass reaching over 3 cm. The mass is primarily hypoechoic. This is a mass found in a 11 years old cat. In addition, we see several target shaped nodules within the hepatic parenchyma. In this last picture, we see actually one of these hepatic nodules aligned with the biopsy guide. And beyond the stomach, we see actually part of this large mass. The fine needle biopsy was performed and confirmed actually a pancreatic carcinoma with metastasis to the liver. Let's look at this ultrasound video of a cat with a pancreatic carcinoma. This is the liver part of the stomach. pancreas and as we follow the pancreatic tissue we see this very large mass very inhomogeneous with irregular contour we go back to the pancreatic tissue and now we will center the ultrasound on the mass large foci that are hyperechoic and associated with strong shadowing supportive of mineralization. This large lesion is about 3 cm in uh, overall width. has also a few cystic lesion. Once the mass tends to be large, it may be at times difficult to determine its origin but a ultrasound guided biopsy and fine needle aspirate were performed and confirmed the diagnosis of pancreatic carcinoma. During this lecture, we already saw a few instances where it is indicated to perform ultrasound guided procedure, such as fine needle aspirate using 22 gauge needle or core biopsy using 18 gauge true cut needle within an automated gun. In this example, we see that we align the guide to the lesion and, with this, and within this guided path, the needle will be inserted in this cavitated lesion that was confirmed later to be an abscess. In addition to have the cytological sample, we could also perform a drainage of the cavity, which really speed up the recovery of this animal. Let's see an example of an ultrasound guided fine needle aspirate. We see the position of the probe 
with the sterile sleeve and the guide opposed to the probe. We will start by doing a color flow evaluation to identify nearby vessels and avoid them. You see the guide path and the needle entering. The color flow is stopped as we know we avoided the vessel and the needle is moved in and out several times. Uh, this concludes the lecture on ultrasonography of the pancreas. Please, if you have any questions, bring them along to the lecture time dedicated to this topic or to the clinical case review that will be organized later in the course. Thank you.